Well, as I said, 2019 will be the worst year of Donald Trump's life. And that is the headline that greeted the third year of the Trump presidency in the Los Angeles Times today. An op-ed piece by John Weiner compares Donald Trump's 2019 to Richard Nixon's 1974, the year the special prosecutor's investigation of the president forced Richard Nixon to resign the presidency. And that article compares Donald Trump's 2019 to Bill Clinton's 1999, when after being impeached by the House of Representatives, Bill Clinton survived an impeachment trial in the United States Senate. 2019 will probably be the year when we discover whether the president can be indicted by Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller. And if Donald Trump is removed from office, the vice president becomes president, and the next person in the line of succession to the presidency is now Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, who began this historic day, on which she resumed the speakership, answering this question from NBC's Savannah Guthrie. Do you believe the special counsel should honor and observe the Department of Justice guidance that states a sitting president cannot be indicted? I do not think that that is a, a conclusive. No, I do not. Could Robert Mueller come back and say, I am seeking an indictment? I think that that is an open discussion. I think that is an open discussion in terms of the law. Donald Trump has gone from a Speaker of the House who did everything he could to help Devin Nunes, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, obstruct a legitimate investigation of Donald Trump to a Speaker of the House who is encouraging the new Democratic chairs of House committees to do their duty to investigate the president and who believes it is possible that the president can be indicted. Nancy Pelosi has gone from discouraging talk of impeachment during the congressional campaigns to allowing one of the senior Democrats in her own California congressional delegation to introduce articles of impeachment in the House of Representatives against President Trump today. We will be joined later in this hour by California Congressman Eric Swalwell, who is a member of the House Judiciary Committee, which has jurisdiction over the impeachment process. We will get his view of what now seems surely to be the worst year of Donald Trump's life. This worst year of Donald Trump's life has begun with one of the most difficult problems a president can possibly face, a government shutdown, and Donald Trump is the very first president in history to publicly blame himself for the shutdown. I will be the one to shut it down. I'm not going to blame you for it. Tonight is the first time in Donald Trump's life as president that he has watched the House of Representatives do something that he did not want them to do. As Rachel reported at the beginning of this hour, Nancy Pelosi pushed legislation through the House tonight to reopen the government. In normal times, Republicans would vote for the Pelosi legislation because they voted for it already. She passed six spending bills tonight that have already been agreed to by Senate Democrats and Senate Republicans, bills that have nothing to do with the border wall that President Trump wants. Speaker Pelosi separately pushed through the House a bill to extend funding for Homeland Security at its current levels temporarily for a month that would allow the President and Congress to continue to struggle over the Trump border wall without the government being shut down. Nancy Pelosi has no doubt about her position on the border wall. Are you willing to come up and give him some of this money for the wall? Because no. apparently that's the sticking no. point. No, nothing for the wall. We're talking about border security. Nothing the for the wall, but that means it's well, a non-starter. Well, we can go through this all back and forth. No. <laughs> How many more times can we say no? Nothing for the wall. Speaker Pelosi's negotiating hand has only been strengthened by the blue wave that has swept Democrats into the majority in the Congress and includes, among the freshman members of the Democratic House, some of the strongest opponents of the border wall, including the already most famous member of the freshman class, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who cast her first vote in the House today in favor of Nancy Pelosi for Speaker of the House. Ocasio-Cortez. Pelosi. She was the only one who voted for Nancy Pelosi, who got any kind of reaction from the Republicans. She is in complete control of those Republicans in commanding their attention and in swatting away their insults. Moments later, 
at her swearing in, Speaker Pelosi, in her acceptance speech of the speakership, announced her legislative strategy for the shutdown. We will debate and advance good ideas no matter where they come from. And in that spirit, Democrats will be offering the Senate Republican appropriations legislation to reopen government later today. Joining our discussion now, Joy Reid, MSNBC national correspondent and the host of AM Joy Weekends on MSNBC. Joy will have a special town hall event at this very hour tomorrow night with Nancy Pelosi right here on MSNBC at 10 p.m. And we are also joined tonight by Michelle Goldberg, New York Times columnist and MSNBC contributor. And Joy Reid, uh, a very impressive day one <laughs> for Nancy Pelosi. And uh, what may be, what may very well be, a basically a day one of the worst year of Donald Trump's life. You know, it's interesting, Lawrence, and you know this uh, better than most, that, you know, I think a lot of people sometimes forget because we've had an era of speakers who deferred, uh, to be, to, to put it the most kind way, to the president of the United States. You've had Paul Ryan who did that, you know, and you also had speakers who were very challenged by members of their own caucus who made it very difficult for them to do their job, John Boehner. But I think people a lot of times forget how powerful the Speaker of the House is. As you said, this is the person who is next in line to the presidency after the president and vice president. Um, and Nancy Pelosi, in taking the speakership a second time, really in hearkening back to powerful speakers that people may remember, like, you know, Tip O'Neill, like really powerful speakers, this is an incredibly powerful position. It's an, it's an incredibly powerful position, particularly when it's in adversarial, um, in an adversarial position to the president, think Newt Gingrich. Nancy Pelosi came in and reminded the people who were listening to her give her acceptance speech today of Article One of the Constitution. And in Article Article 1, Section 7, Clause 1 of the Constitution, it says all bills for raising revenue uh, shall originate in the House of Representatives, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments. The, this is where spending comes from. If Donald Trump wants money for a wall, it has to go through Nancy Pelosi. There's no other way around it. So he is now negotiating with the woman who is a master vote counter, who has done this job before, and who knows government as well as he has ignored the rudiments of government, the workings of government. So this is going to be a really tough sled for Donald Trump. Uh, Michelle Goldberg, you know, as a kid growing up in Boston, I, I grew up through two Boston speakers of the House, John McCormick and then Tip O'Neill, and one Boston president when I was a little kid, uh, John Kennedy. And most politicians in Boston, when they needed something, they always <laughs> went to John McCormick or they went to Tip O'Neill. Uh, that's where the power is. We could do an hour on how powerful that position is. It's it's one of the reasons why during the presidential campaign, when I thought Donald Trump was not going to be president, mm -hmm. I would occasionally say, you know, when he attacks Paul Ryan like that, when he attacks the Speaker of the House, if he ever became president, he would discover how much power the Speaker has over him. And I was so wrong <laughs> about that because of the collapse of so many things, including apparently the collapse of male ego, which might be a good thing in Washington. But Paul Ryan as Speaker used none of his power in relation to this president. So this president, two years in, has no idea right, and think what of the how, powers of the speakership And think are. of how frustrated Donald Trump has been just by the very rudimentary constraints that he's already faced, right? That he can't rule by fiat, that he basically has to at least, you know, pretend to abide by the laws of the land, right? That he's, in some respects, checked by the Supreme Court. He's had these very minor constraints on what he imagined was a kind of regal authority, and it's driven him bonkers. And so now he's going to have both nonstop investigations and an inability to really get anything substantive done unless he is able to negotiate with Nancy Pelosi, who, despite, you know, not his kind of ridiculous reputation as a master negotiator, he has nothing on her. He has no experience commensurate with hers. Uh, Joy, tomorrow when you get to talk to uh, Speaker Pelosi about this, uh, where do you intend to begin with her? Well, I think obviously we have to start with the situation we have now, right? The shutdown, because the impasse here is complete. Donald Trump has said he wants $5.5 billion for a wall that he originally said Mexico would supply all of the funding for. Nancy Pelosi said to our own colleague, Savannah Guthrie, no money, zero. You get nothing for the wall. Um, so that is an, the ultimate impasse. And now you have the Senate Majority Leader who has said he will only put on the floor a bill that Donald Trump has already affirmed that he supports. 
courts, which is an incredible diminution of his own power. Because easily, this could easily be solved, right, if the Senate Majority Leader said, fine, Speaker Pelosi has now passed six bills that reopen the government. We'll simply repass the same bills that we passed before. These were our bills, right, from the previous Senate, and be done with it and let Trump veto it or not. But, you know, it's, an, it's incredible to me. I don't know if it is to you, too, Lawrence. We've entered an era of no vetoes, where Congress doesn't even allow the president to exercise the constitutional power to veto. They won't even let him do it. They say if he isn't already for it, Mitch McConnell, who's supposed to be an enormously powerful man, has said, I won't do anything unless Donald Trump says I can. That's extraordinary, because the Constitution was designed to have each of these bodies jealously guard their power. And I just think that Americans are just not accustomed to that jealous guarding of power. Well, they're going to get accustomed to it now, <laughs> because the, <laughs> the new Speaker of the House is going to guard and use her power. So I think what we're going to start is to talk about the way she intends to use her power. And Michelle, I, I do want to pause and reflect over this historic moment. Here we are, as Nancy Pelosi herself pointed out today, a hundred years away from women getting the right to vote in this country. And we have a woman speaker for the second time, the same woman. Uh, and we have many more women members of Congress and women members of the Senate than we've ever had before. But we're still not at 50-50. We're not close to 50-50. And one of the measures that we're looking at in those hundred years is how long it takes a denied population to catch up once you open the door. I mean, it was so striking, the side-by-side -side visuals of, like you said, it's you know not a parody, but it is still a freshman class on the Democratic mm -hmm. side, unlike anything that we've ever had before. So you had this you know panorama of America, all of these incredibly inspiring stories, these firsts. You know, it was the sort of America that a lot of us had thought that we lost mm -hmm. when Donald Trump became president. And then you have you know not just this overwhelmingly white male old Republican caucus, but Donald Trump trying to steal some of Nancy Pelosi's thunder by giving this sort of ridiculous address to the press backed by four identical bald clones in the White House briefing room, right? I mean, it's, you know, you really, it's hard to imagine a starker representation of two different Americas. And I also have to say that, you know, this is the first time that I've actually felt like maybe something good has come out of the calamity of Donald Trump's presidency, right? Because he didn't, you know, build his wall and he is not going to accomplish most of what he set out to accomplish. But he did build that. I don't think a lot of those people in the Democratic side would have run, would have given up the lives that they had lived before they ventured into politics had not, you know, this kind of national emergency arisen with his with his election. Troy, I want to get your reflections on what you saw on the House floor today. You know, it was extraordinary. Uh, Nancy Pelosi prioritized children. You know, there was that amazing moment where she brought not only her own grandchildren, but all the children in the gallery up to stand with her as she took the oath of office, as she raised her right hand. And I think that she was at that moment, giving you sort of both sides of the spectrum of what women bring to power. She obviously is somebody who is not embarrassed about seeking and pursuing power. She's not embarrassed to wield power. But she also is still a grandmother. She also is still a woman who cares about children, who has that nurturing side of her nature and isn't embarrassed to show it. And I think for a lot of women in trying to figure out how do you balance, how do you wield, you know, authority, whether it's political authority, whether it's authority in the business world, that is the balance, right, is how much of each of those two sides of yourself do you bring to the table? I think, you know, Donald Trump, because he's not, as Michelle said, accustomed to dealing with a powerful equal, particularly a woman who's a powerful equal. This is going to be an extraordinary education for him. I think he's going to learn a huge civics lesson. He's never had a board of directors. But now he's got a woman who is mu as much a CEO as he is. And it's going to be interesting to see how he navigates a world in which Nancy Pelosi is a boss. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on the button below for more from The Last Word and the rest of MSNBC.